Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, my clock says I got four minutes, but the church says it's time. <laughs> Is that right? Yes. <laughs> That's right. You're wrong. <laughs> oh, good. Let's get started. <laughs> So last week we uh, began with uh, kind of an introduction of 1 Corinthians. Uh, we covered the first introduction, which was Paul's uh, greeting to the church, uh, verses 1 through 3. And then we kind of got started on uh, 4 through 10, but I, I got only halfway there. And so... We're going to back up a little bit. We're going to start at verse 4 this morning. And we won't uh, hammer everything word for word like we do sometimes. But uh, we're going to try to get all the way to verse 17. And, um, and I just didn't feel like I could get the whole chapter and do it justice. Um, you know, there, there's two ways to do this. You can do it really slow and really get into the, the, the topics and, and stuff like that. Or you can do it kind of fast and and cover the, the whole passage. Uh, and there's pros and cons for both methods. I tend to, as I study, I keep finding things I want to talk about. <laughs> and so I tend to slow down a little bit. And one of my elders one time said, David, don't you think you ought to speed up a little bit? I go, well, we're going to be here till the Lord comes back. And it doesn't matter how fast we get through it. You know, as long as we're not just talking about the same thing over and over again. So anyway, in saying that, we're going to go from like uh, verse 14, 4 to verse 17, but I don't, want, I, I don't want to spend all my time reading. And so let's just read uh, from 4 to verse 9, and then that's one section that we want to talk about. Verse 10 through 17 will be our next section, and, uh, and that way we don't spend every, you know, 10 minutes talking or reading. But anyway, if you guys will stand with me, we're going to read verses four through nine together and then we'll open in the word of prayer i thank my god always concerning you for the grace of god which was given to you by christ jesus that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterances and all knowledge even as the testimony of christ was confirmed in you so that you come short in no gifts eagerly waiting for the revelations of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, Father God, we just thank you so much for your word. We ask that your spirit would open up our minds and our ears and our hearts to what you have to say to us this morning. Father God, we know that I haven't got anything worth saying. And so I just ask that you would anoint my words and that we would hear your voice, not mine. We love you this morning, Father. And we just commit this Bible study to you, to your glory, to your honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we started this uh, section where Paul is going to... Uh, encourage the church and, and, and kind of lift them up and tell them you know that he's thankful for them and some good things and and he does that because the rest of the book is going to be a, a, a letter of correction and there are different places where the correction is harder other places where it's just instructional and uh in some places where he is actually you know telling them to shape up or ship out in a way and so uh, he uses these first verses here to encourage them, to, to build them up. And, you know, one of the things I think I mentioned it last week is that I was in business for uh, 30 years, pretty much. Dad and I were together, and then Dad retired and I took over. And anytime you're in that position, you have to pull people aside, right? And, and you know, Tell them to sit down. I was thinking about this this morning or yesterday because as a pastor, you have to do that too. And and, and sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative. And I remember pulling a couple in and saying, you know, if you guys come into my office, I need to talk to you. 
And they, it was a positive thing. I can't remember what it was about. But they would sit there and they go, oh, no, no, what did we do wrong? What did we do wrong? What did we do? And, and I don't want people to think that whenever I say, hey, I want to talk to you for a minute. And, uh, but one of the things I think is important is we correct people because everybody needs correction, right? I need correction. You guys need correction. Is that sometimes if you can just point out the good things, things that God are doing, things that are, that are positive, then it lightens the idea of, uh, of, of what they're doing wrong. And uh, now I know that that doesn't work all the time, but I just think it's kind of an important uh, principle that we need to learn from Paul. And, and that's what Paul's doing. Paul is telling them, you know, if you, if you go back uh, even to verse 3, grace to you and peace from our God and Father. Uh, he's going to tell them that God is working in their lives and he's going to actually establish the fact that these are, this is the church. Even with all of their problems and all of the sin and, and, and misunderstandings and all like that, this is God's holy church. And last week we looked at a couple things. We noticed in the, um, the verse uh, 4 and 5 kind of together. It says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which has been given to you. By Jesus Christ, that you may that you were enriched in everything by Him, in all utterances and all knowledge. As we pointed out last week, the first two things that this church had it had gifts, and it had knowledge. And the gifts of utterances, I believe there are some difference of opinion, but I believe the gifts of utterances are the gifts of speaking in tongues, the gifts of prophesying, the gifts of evangelizing. Gifts that require you speak. Uh, words come out of your mouth. Uh, it's gifts of utterance. Does that make sense to me? And, and I think, after I read some of the other opinions, the reason I still lean to that opinion is because Paul is writing a lot about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so it only makes sense that this, you know, when he speaks of gifts here, and he speaks of gifts there, and he speaks of gifts here, they're all referring to gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so I believe that this church has gifts of utterances and gifts of knowledge. And there are another a, a group of uh, spiritual gifts that require special knowledge. The gift of knowledge, uh, to speak a word of wisdom, uh, uh, and, and, and so on. And so uh, those are things that this church has that, that makes them a spiritual church. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out is this. This church, and we're going to see even as we go on, had gifts. They were even having problems with their gifts, uh, misusing some of the gifts and not understanding how some of the gifts should be used. But they were spiritually gifted church, and yet they were a very carnal church. And that to me tells me that we can have spiritual gifts. We can be spiritually minded. And because of pride and selfishness and other problems, we can also be a very carnal church. I don't want to talk about church. I can be a very carnal person. And, and we've got to deal with that in our own lives. We don't want to let carnality uh, rule us. We want to let spirituality rule us. Verse 6, it says, Even as, you, as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, um, some of your Bibles have it a little bit different. It speaks more of, of, being able, of, of speaking about Jesus Christ. The testimony, giving a, a testimony or talking about Christ in your life. And, and this is something that this church is known for or is, is uh, praised for. Is the fact that they were able to, uh, they enjoyed talking about Jesus. And, you know, I thought about that because, I mean, we, we come together in a church setting and we, you know, you know, pray for people and we talk a little bit about the Lord. But do we spend a lot of time in our daily lives just talking about Jesus? I, I remember when I was 18, 19, 20, uh, I lived in a, uh, a neighborhood where behind me was a Church of Christ School of preaching. 
and someone has bought up nearly every house on our block for those students who rent to those students. And so I had Church of Christ to be preachers knocking on my doors. And in a way, you know, they would knock on them and they say, well, why don't we come talk to you a little bit about the Bible? Well, heck yes, come on in. And we would sit down and we would, we would argue, we would discuss, uh, we debate. Uh, Cynthia doesn't think it's great the way I debate, but I enjoy having two points of view. And, I, and if both points of view were the same, I was guilty sometimes of taking the second point of view, even though I didn't believe it. Because you, you can't have a discussion if everybody agrees, like, yep, yeah, I agree, yep, yeah, I agree, and it's over. You know, and so we would spend, and we would set up like from 8 to 2 o'clock in the morning, drinking coffee, talking about the Bible, talking about Jesus Christ. I love that. And, you know, I wish. Even today, I have that uh, in my life. If any of you guys want to stay up at 2 o'clock and talk about Jesus, give me a call. Because I'll probably won't answer your phone. But if you want to stay up until 10 o'clock, because I go to bed between 9 and 10, then give me a call. But these guys love talking about Jesus. And, you know, there should be nothing that we enjoy more than talking about Jesus. I mean, talking about Jesus, you know, and how good he is, how awesome he is, what he did, how he's doing things, uh, what we're expecting. Uh, Jesus is what we're all about. We're not about the Assembly of God, First Assembly of God Church of Mount Mary. We are about Jesus. And Jesus has got to be our, 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 our main thing. That's what these guys, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. You talked about Jesus everywhere, all the time. Verse 7 says, So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So these guys, because they, they love Jesus, they had all these gifts, and these gifts were, were, were getting them to the place where they could minister to each other. They were uh, waiting eagerly for the revelation of Jesus Christ. Which is what? The revelation of Jesus Christ is his second return as he revealed himself again. And so, and, and if you go on down here, uh, verse 8 it says, Who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless on the day of, the, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ? The day of the Lord refers to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Always, when you see that in scriptures, the day of the Lord always refers to the second return. So this church, it talked about Jesus, but it also was waiting for the return of Jesus Christ, uh, waiting for him, and they were anticipating it. Um, turn with me real quick. I, I want to show you this because uh, I've had people say, well, uh, it's going to be Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 24. Um, but people would say things like, um, you know, the Bible doesn't say we have to go to church. Have you ever heard that? The Bible doesn't say we need to go to church. We can, I can love God without going to church. Well, the Bible does say we should go to church. And it's in, it's in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, which if you're not real familiar, it's to the right in your Bible somewhere. And uh, chapter 10. It, uh, it, it says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Verse 24, starting verse 24, really 25, but 24 is where we start. Everybody got it? And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of together, the assembly of ourselves together, as it is the manners of some. But extorting one another, and so much more as we see the day approaching. The day of the council in my book. That means the day of the Lord returning. And, and what it, uh, the writer of Hebrew, which we don't know who wrote it for sure, is saying is that we need to come together and we need to talk about Jesus. 
And we need to talk about the second return of Christ, and we need to encourage each other. If you're having a hard week, you know what? I want to encourage you to think about Christ coming back for you. If you're having a hard time with an area of sin, you know, uh, the best thing I've ever seen to, uh, to deal with sin is having that in my mind that Jesus could return at any time. Uh, I always like to advise a, a father gave his daughter on her first date. She, she said, whatever, Susie, if you'll put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in between you and your boyfriend, it will keep you out of a lot of trouble. And, and, and the truth is, is that if we remember that Christ could return at any moment, any time, we're going to live a different kind of life. We are not going to want to be caught in a compromising uh, position. Uh, not that she doesn't know it anyway, but nevertheless, that having that in your mind. And we need to encourage people that way. You know, we need to tell people, you know, lighten up, smile, uh, rejoice. For, you know, the Lord can return any time. And as the day comes closer, you know, some say, well, it's been 2,000 years. That just tells you how close we are. You know, <coughs> if it's already gotten 2,000 years, we've got to be getting close to his return. And, uh, and we want to encourage people to do that. Those are the things that uh, the church was known for. And, you know, I think it would only make sense uh, that we should be known for those same things, don't it? That there were people, you know, we've all come in contact with people and they say, well, I don't want to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Because then the church is known for hypocrites. Or I, you know, I don't like that church because uh, blank. That church is known for whatever that is. What we want to be known for is one, that we love each other and that we express that love uh, in our body and outside of our church body. That people know that we love one another. And that, that's expressed even to those outside of our immediate fellowship. Two, we want to be known that, for the fact that we talk about Jesus. When people see us, they go, well, that guy is a, I mean, whenever I was 18, 19, and I was in, in these conversations a lot more. People sometimes called me a Jesus freak. Because that was, you know, in the 70s, and, and so that was the, the term they used. Uh, because I talked about Jesus. That was my main uh, joy and, and, and hope in life. Who want me known for that kind of stuff? This church was known for that. Yeah, it, it is. Like, well, thank you. I'm glad you see that in my life. But it, you know what? I had to be called that a long time. Yeah, at 65, very few people call you Jesus freak. But uh, nevertheless, I wish people would. And, and the last thing here that I really want to stress is that we should be known for uh, expectation of the return of Christ, the second return. We ought to be waiting and hoping and watching for Christ's return in our lives. Uh, as I was kind of looking at that, I got thinking, you know, we just covered the book of John, right? First John. What was the main, a couple of, there's a couple of main themes of John. You like to think of? Love. Love. Love for one another. Well, what's the main theme that we're going to, we're just getting ready to enter into it. Uh, we talk about division. And, uh, and, and so the, the, the theme that we should love one another, we should care for one another, we should have uh, a relationship with one another. John, or that was John, the apostle, the apostle of love. And now we're in Corinthians, and Paul is saying, hey guys, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, we shouldn't have divisions, and we shouldn't have uh, schisms and, and so on. Uh, and what's another one? Can you think of another one? One of the things that, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> the one I'm thinking of is that we've talked a number of times about the second return of Christ, mm -hmm. going through the book of John. Mm -hmm. And I see the same thing in 1 Corinthians. Right off the bat, uh, uh, Paul is looking for the second return of Christ. 
John was looking for the second return of Christ. Peter, right, and he's looking for the second return of Christ. And that becomes a, those two things throughout all of New Testament scripture, the church is to be a body of believers that love one another, that are waiting for the Christ return. And, and, and that's in nearly every book of the New Testament as you go through it. But there's problems, right? We are human. And humans have problems. They have problems with each other. Uh, right now, the divorce rate is over 50%. That, if you think about that, these are two people who were madly in love with each other. They can't stand each other at all. So bad that they were willing to divorce, split their families, and go their separate ways. And yet, that's the way it is. Uh, and, and you look at any type of relationships, uh, whether you're in business with somebody, and there's just this constant uh, friction because we have a center here, we have a center here, and they hit each other. They run into each other. And the truth is, is even in a church, I say even in a church, but especially in a church, you have a group of people from different backgrounds, from different educational, from different spiritual levels, all coming together and trying to make this work. If you remember, as we did a little bit of our introductions last week, uh, we talked about the fact that Corinth was known as this metropolitan city. Uh, the, the sailors would come in on one side of the coast for the port, and they would pick their boats up, and they would roll it across the land, about four miles, and they would drop it into the other side, and vice versa. They would come in on the uh, east side, pick their stuff up, and roll it to the west side, and that kept them from having to sail the whole peninsula of Greece there. And if you were to draw a picture of the kind of people in Corinth, it would look a lot like, say, New York, where people are coming in, uh, and, and that's the first place they land from uh, Ireland, England, and Africa, and Europe. And, and, and there, inside of New York City, there's this, this a wide variety. If you walk down the street, and there'll be Jewish people with the curls. You'll walk down a few more steps, and there'll be a, a Muslim with the habit thing on. Chinatown. What's that? Chinatown. Chinatown. <laughs> yeah, it's huge. And, uh, and, and, and as people come in, it takes a couple of years for people to actually blend in with the average. So they're, they're new. That's the way Corinth was. It had people from every walk of life. You know, uh, every country, they all came there, and some would stay, some would just uh, mill in. And the church looked like that a lot. Not only that, they had different ideals. Because if you think about it, uh, a, a group of people from China, they think a certain way. And it ain't going to be the, it isn't going to be the <laughs> way that they think in Ireland. All right, you're down there. Yeah. <laughs> When I was in college, I took a, a class on voice and articulation, and, and the lady said, well, I'll, I can get that accent out of you. I don't want it. This is who I am. Uh, but, what was that? They were all the different kinds of people in court. They were, they, they, and they had different ideals, okay? That's what my point is. Some brought in Chinese uh, uh philosophy, uh, Greek philosophy, African philosophy, and, and they would all come together, and they would mix. And so like, I mean, if you grew up here in Mountain Air, and you go to this church, you probably think like the guy next to you. Pretty much. You know, but in this church, people thought about everything, and every idea, and every moral, immoral or, or morality, what people thought about morality, was different as well. They, they had all kinds of, of things mixing together, and you know, the truth of that's going to cause more problems. Uh, and, and so, uh, 
Paul is going to address that. In, in, in verse 10, I like the way he starts off. He goes, Now I plead with you, brother, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing to all, speaking the same thing that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Uh, the first thing I want to point it out is that Paul could have said, you know what, I demand that you guys straighten up or ship out. He was the founder of this church. He was the first pastor. Uh, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was a super, I would call a super spiritual, intellectual, uh, wise. You know, he had, he had all the credentials of the first church of Corinth. And he could have said, you know what? I demand you guys straighten up. But instead, he has this heart that says, guys, I plead with you. I, I, it's my desire that, you know, uh, that, that you get along. It's my desire that you have this fellowship, that we correct these problems. I plead with you. And again, I think that's a good way to live your life. Uh, whenever I was uh, in business, I could demand anything I wanted to because I could fire you the next day, you know? And whenever I was a pastor of our church, our church in corn, uh, corn. <laughs> it wasn't as simple as corn, but it has some problems too. But our church, uh, the way our, our, our structure was, we, we had elders and we had deacons, but it was a pastor run church. And so, uh, I would meet with my elders and we would have discussions about different things and then I made the decision. And people who like Calvary like that and people who hate Calvary hate that. And so it's just the way it is. There's a lot of churches like that. Uh, so we had no board that actually told me what to do, what not to do. And, uh, and because of that, you know, I had a lot of authority and, and I had to watch that. We had, you always have to watch that. But I could demand things. I, and, and, you know, to speak the truth, I would start off a lot of time like, I, I plead with you that we do blah, 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 that we take deal with this. Then when it didn't work, I said, you know what? I'm the boss. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> and, and that's not always good. Sometimes you have to to make things run. But that's not the way we should run. We should have unity. And that's what Paul is, is demanding. Now, a couple of things I, I came across I thought was really interesting. Uh, is um, it says here um, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Well, well first of all, I want you to understand uh, before we deal with a couple of words here is that just because you're of the same mind and judgment doesn't mean you all think the same way. Uh, Paul is saying that, that no one can have an opinion. No one can think different. He's just saying that when you do think different, you share that, and then you don't let that bring division. You have to sometimes give up your rights because someone else may think the other way, but, but, it, but you're willing, you hope people are willing to lay down their rights to see unity more than they are to see their their point of view uh, prosper. And so that I think that's a principle that we need to have. Uh, second thing, you know, it says there be no divisions. Um, the word division in the Greek is where we get our word schisms. And when I think of schisms, I think of, first of all, I think of, you know, my group, your group, our group. And, and, and it, there's, of course, in English, that's very much part of it. Uh, here it's not so much talking about parties or groups, but in, I thought this was interesting. It's talking about tearing and, and, and rendering, tearing something apart. The schism tears you apart. And, and he's saying, let there be no tearing the body apart over these issues. Uh, and, and he's going to talk a little bit about division of Christ here in a minute. But can you imagine? Uh, if God was to look at some churches where there was a uh, fighting going on and there, everybody's kind of laying on the pews, one's got a broken arm, one's got a broken leg, a couple of black eyes, 
you know, and, and spiritually speaking, I believe that's kind of what at the Corinthian church looked like. They were fighting so much that they were they were just tearing each other apart. Uh, and what we what we do as church people, we don't most times we don't punch somebody in the nose, but we talk about it. Or we, you know, uh, situate ourselves to have authority over them so that we can push them down. And, and in our own way, we're throwing a punch and breaking their nose. And, and, and Jesus, or Paul is saying, listen, let there not be any tearing apart uh, or, 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 or ripping each other. Then he goes on and says, uh, that you be perfectly jointed together. Well, in Greek, in, in the original language, this means, uh, and Barclay says this, he says, joining together is like uh, minting something and mending it. And so, like, you know, I, I, I was thinking of, uh, well, you know, like if you broke your arm and it was a compound fracture, what would they do? Well, first of all, they would, they would line it back up. And then they would put maybe a plate there and, and, a, and a pen. And they would knit that foam back together so that it could heal. Or they would put a cast over it so you couldn't move it. And, and as it stayed in one place, it would be knitted back together the way our, our body works. And that's what Paul is saying is that, you know, let there be no divisions among you. And where there have been, let's knit those back together. Let's try to build this, this bond together. Verse 11, he goes on, he says, For as they declared to me concerning you, my brethren from, the, from those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Uh, we don't really know who Chloe is. Uh, this is the only time her name is mentioned. Uh, it, it, she's probably a, a, a wealthy business person. Uh, they had uh, servants. And, uh, and people that did business for her, and her servants or her, her people had left. And they were they were, uh, they were from Corinth, and they had some reason they had traveled to Ephesus. That's where Paul was at. Remember, uh, when Paul wrote the book of Corinth, he was in Ephesus, and they had gone to Paul. And said, Paul, the church there in Corinth, they're having all these problems, and here's a few of them. Uh, and we're going to look at them, but uh, and so uh, I kind of think Chloe was a, a Christian. We don't know that for sure. The servants could have gone on their own because they had the right to travel, and obviously the servants were part of that church because they knew what was going on. But uh, but Paul heard of some of the problems that were happening. Now, also later on, or close to the same period of time, Paul receives a letter from that church. And in the letter, it, it's not so much talking about these problems that we're going to address here, but it's talking about like, well, Paul, what about, you know, is it okay to remarry if we get divorced? Or Paul, what about this or that? And Paul, we don't know what the questions are, but we know what Paul's answers are. And so you can almost, you know, read the answer and, you know, play the game. What is it that has a, what is, you know, you, you give the answer anyway. That, <laughs> Jeopardy. You know, so, so Paul would say, you know, let me tell you the, the problem or how to deal with uh, remarried and, and, and divorced. Question is, what is, you know, how do we deal with marriage and so on? Uh, but these problems are, are a problem. The first problem that we're going to deal with here are problems probably that Chloe's household brought. It said, first of all, says, uh, if you will go on, it says in verse 12, now I say that, so he's kind of repeating what they talked about. Now I say that, that each of you say, I am a Paul, and I'm an Apollos. I am a Cephas, or I am a Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Uh, Let's stop there. So, what these servants that came to uh, the brother that came from Chloe's household said, Paul, there's 
these different factions or different groups of people, and one of them are saying, hey, I am a Paul. Paul was the founder of this church. He was an apostle. They had seen Paul do miracles because Paul did have uh, signs and wonders that followed them. And they were saying, I follow Paul. Now there was also those that said, no, oh, you know, a, a man named Apollos had been there. And Apollos was known for his ability to speak. In fact, I want to look at that real quick. Turn it, if you will, to Acts chapter uh, 18 again. We, we, we looked at that last week. Um, Acts 18, verse 17. Uh, actually, that's not what I want to look at. I want to look at uh, Acts 18, verse oh, uh, 24. That's what I wrote down. Where I got 17 at. <laughs> verse two, uh, 24 it says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, that's the same man we're talking about, born of Exal, 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 Alexander. Yeah. Alexander. an elegant man, and mighty in the scripture, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and be, being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he, though he had only known the baptism of John. And so, whenever Apollos first came to the church, he would begin to preach, and he began to preach very eloquently. Uh, probably one of the things that the Greeks really uh, admired was someone who could speak very intelligently, big words, big phrases. They, they wouldn't like me at all. <laughs> and they're right. Say it wrong. And, uh, and, and this was the way Apollos was. Now, Apollos, when he first came, he didn't know anything about Jesus. He was preaching the repentance of John the Baptist. And Apollos, or, uh, not Apollos, but, uh, uh, and suffered uh, Priscilla and Aquila took him in and they instructed him more about Jesus Christ and that you know how John came to a forerunner of Jesus Christ and, and he became a Christian and he began to preach and he was a good preacher and that's what they're saying here is some saying you know this preacher that came back to uh, Ephesus you know all elegant I'm of, I'm, I'm of him. I'm, I'm of his group. The third group that's mentioned here is Cephas. And Cephas is just another name for Peter, the apostle Peter, one of the twelve disciples. Uh, there is no indication that Peter ever went to Ephesus. And, and, and so they were probably saying, you know what? You guys are okay. And I know these guys started the church and we've been preaching here. But I'm following the guy who, who is, is the Pope. Right, <laughs> I'm the I'm not following with Peter, and, uh, and 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 then the last group said, you know what? Do with all of those. I'm following Jesus Christ and Him alone. All four groups aren't really. They're not arguing a doctrinal statement like Paul was teaching this, and Paul was teaching that, Peter was teaching this. They were all teaching the same thing. In fact, there's no indication throughout Scripture that they had any problem between any of those uh, three or four of Jesus Christ in their teaching. They were all teaching the same thing. Uh, and they didn't fight with Jesus. They didn't bring people into their camp. They were just ministering the gospel of God. I believe that these people were taken sides because they were prideful. They wanted a little more authority as they made their arguments for whatever they were arguing about. You know what? You, could, you, know, you guys are doing okay, but you know, you're not, uh, I, I, I've, been, I've been with Paul ever since he came to this church, you know. And it was more of a pride issue, a developing a, a, a sense of, you know, listen to me, give me the authority. <laughs> and that's where this is so deadly wrong. When I was in high school, there's a girl that sat in front of me, I don't remember her name, uh, but she went to an older Pentecostal church. She wore long dresses at the time, with you know, without side of whatever veils wore. 
And, uh, and I enjoy talking to her. And I, I kind of liked her, not as a girlfriend, but we just became friends and we talked. And um, I, I told her, I said, one day, I, we were going to a church in Lubbock that was considered a charismatic church. You know, we believed all the same things pretty much the Pentecostals did, but we just weren't as loud. <laughs> and she goes, she goes, well, that's good. You just not quite arrived yet. You know, if you were, you know, if you were a little more spirit filled, you'd be rolling down the aisles, not just lifting your hands. And, and, and that kind of the way these people were doing, they were being prideful, like, I am a this and I am that. Now, <laughs> what I want to think, say is this, is that I was thinking about this because I don't think we have that problem. And yet, uh, I'm not sure that we don't have problems sometimes, not with people, but maybe with denominations or churches. Um, there are things we can divide over. We should, we should divide over. If a, if a church says that Jesus Christ is the brother of Satan, you know, that, that's not a Christian church. I don't care what they say. If someone says that, uh, that, that, that we're all little gods, and that, uh, and, and, you know, that Jesus Christ, you know, was a God, not the God, and that he was not the third part, or second part of the Trinity. Those are, those are things that we should separate over. But, our Baptist friends, they believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he lived a pure and perfect life, that he died on the cross, he rose again on the third day, and that there is no other way to salvation but through him. The Methodists believe that. The Church of Christ believes that. <laughs> now, the Church of Christ believes that you can't have a guitar or a piano. That's fine. I like guitars and pianos. And I, and I think that, that God does too. <laughs> but I'm not going to separate over that. I'm not going to say he's not my brother or my sister. You know, he just doesn't get to enjoy the music that I get to enjoy. Right? And, uh, I say that kind of because I want to act like I'm arrogant and proud. But, but you know, th they have their reason for saying that. And, uh, and the Baptists, you know, they, they don't believe that the gifts for today, that the, the gifts that we believe are active today, they believe they all ceased after the time of the apostles. You know what? I disagree with them. But they believe that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again, and there's no other way to salvation. That's what keeps us together. And so we need to take that, you know, and, and believe that, but not let, not let that separate us. The differences are, are okay. And, and, and that's why we have a Baptist church here in town. We have a Temple of God. And we have a church of Christ. So all the people who believe their way can still worship the same Jesus Christ as we are this morning. And so uh, I don't want us to be wide. And we're going to have to Speed up here again. Uh, it says, "Were you ever uh, was Christ divided? You know, you get the picture. Was Christ pulled apart over here, over here, and maybe a leg over here, and I got the head over here? You know, that's just. You know, I don't know if you know this or not. It's kind of funny when you think about it biblically. But Paul had a sense of humor and a sarcastic little problem. and sometimes he could be very sarcastic." I never liked sarcasm, but uh, but I identify in Paul a, a lot, and I think that's what he said. You guys kidding? Me? Is, is Jesus uh, was he divided? Was he pulled apart? Is there four of them, or was Paul that, uh, crucified for you? No, of course not. Paul didn't get crucified. He was still there. It didn't matter if he was. Uh, he, he didn't live a perfect life, and so on. And uh, this is were you baptized in the name of Paul? Uh, and I think this is this this is where it does become uh, relevant to us. Um, people will get baptized and, and and identify with that person that baptized them. And you know it, it doesn't matter whether you're baptized, you know, by the our pastor or the the head of our convention or or a lay pastor down the road. You know, baptism is about you and Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and that's what I think he's saying. He's like, listen. I'll, and then he goes on. He goes, I only baptized a few people. He names them uh, uh, Crispus. If you remember from last week, Crispus was the 
a guy from the, uh, the synagogue that was next door to the church. He got saved, gave us, and he goes, Les, I should uh, say that they've been baptized in my own name. And of course, no pastor should ever baptize somebody in their name. That's not something we baptize in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. We never do it in, in our name. Then he goes on and says, oh yeah, I forgot, I, I did baptize the family or the household of Stephanas. Besides that, I don't know whether I baptized any others. Uh, verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of the words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Paul is saying this, that I didn't come to baptize everybody, which I think is an interesting uh, concept because there are a church, some churches out there, that believe that you should, as soon as you say, amen, I accept Christ, you should be baptized. Because if you're not, you might not go to heaven. That, that baptism is required for regeneration. We don't believe that. And uh, and I think right here is a good argument. If Paul had, if, if regeneration, that baptism regeneration was relevant or true, then we would be we have a bucket of water up here after every service to make sure that if you came to Christ, you got done, right? And, and Paul, and if, and if, if it's true, then Paul is being kind of blasphemed. I didn't, God didn't call me to baptize. <gasps> what? You know, if he called me to preach the gospel, I, yeah, I baptize people. Uh, but uh, that's not what I've been called. I've been called to preach the gospel. And uh, and so I'm on, I want to talk next week a little bit about the last half of 17 uh, the wisdom of, uh, not with wisdom or words I preach the gospel not with wisdom or words lest, any, lest the cross should be of no effect uh, I think that falls within the next portion of scriptures where we're going to talk about the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of a man and, and of God and so anyway Amen, let's pray Father God, we want to just thank you so much for our time together this morning. We ask that you bless our pastor as he gets ready to teach, that as we worship, we would be able to honor you and lift our hearts to you and, and just be filled with your spirit, Lord. Uh, receive our worship as we, we worship you through the study of your word and we worship you through songs and, and hymns and spiritual songs. We love you this morning, Father. We do want to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.